Hello, and welcome to you all. My name is Professor Anne Karagosian, and it is my pleasure and privilege as the director of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA to welcome you to our latest lecture of this academic year to be delivered today by our own Dr. Melissa Bilal on the subject of feminism, theology, and liberation in Mari Bailerian's writings. It is particularly significant for us to hear a talk at this time on this very important person in Armenian history, as Mari Bailerian was not only an early feminist activist, teacher, writer, and public figure, but also tragically a victim of the Armenian genocide in 1915. For today's lecture, I am grateful to note the co-sponsorship of the UCLA Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and the Ararat Eskijin Museum. As become our practice, my colleague, Professor Sebu Aslanian, will provide formal introductions for our speaker in a moment. But first, let me note that for those of you watching live via the Zoom webinar platform, you have an opportunity to send us questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your screen and typing in the question. Please be sure to be as specific as possible in your question and we will direct as many of the questions as are practical to our lecturer when she is finished speaking. We anticipate that the lecture itself will take around 45 to 50 minutes, after which we will begin our Q&A session. Please note that the lecture is also being recorded for future viewing at our Promise Armenian Institute website. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the webinar over to Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA's Department of History. Professor Aslanian is the inaugural director of the Promise of the Armenian Studies Center within the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute. And he has been the holder of the Richard Havanissian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History since 2012. Professor Aslanian has recently published two essays on early modern Armenian history, one with the Journal of World History, the other with the celebrated French journal Annal Histoire Science Sociale. He has also completed his second book manuscript, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512 to, 1518, to 1800, which is expected to appear through Yale University Press in 2022. And now, Sebu, I'll turn the webinar over to you. Sebu, you need to unmute. Yes. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, well, thank you very much, Anne, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for joining us today. I join my esteemed colleague, Dr. Anne Karagosian, in welcoming you to this important event hosted by our Institute. We are truly honored and thankful to have Dr. Melissa Bilal with us today in making this event possible. After my brief introduction, Dr. Bilal will deliver her talk titled Feminism, Theology, and Liberation, Mari Beilerian's Writings and will speak for roughly 45 to 50 minutes, following which, which we will immediately open the floor for questions. I ask you or remind you again to uh, audience members to write down your questions as succinctly as possible and to communicate them to us via the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen as Dr. Karagosian uh, mentioned. We will field as many of these questions as time will permit us. So now uh, for our introduction, for my introduction of Dr. Bilal. Melissa Bilal is a historian and sociocultural anthropologist specializing in music studies. She is currently distinguished fellow at the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies and a lecturer in the Department of Ethnomusicology. She has previously taught at the University of Chicago, Columbia University, 
Boazici University and the American University of Armenia, where she is still a working member of the core team developing the Gender Studies program. Dr. Bilal received her BA and MA in Sociology at Boazici University in Istanbul and earned her PhD in music or ethnomusicology from the University of Chicago. She was a Mellon postdoctoral teaching fellow in music at Columbia University and a postdoctoral research fellow at the Orient Institute in Istanbul. Her recent publications include the article Lullabies and the Memory of Pain, Armenian Women's Remembrance of the Past in Turkey, uh, as well as a voice as well as voice imprint recordings of Russian Armenian POWs in German camps 1916 to 1918, a CD project that aims to bring into the public domain of audibility the Armenian experience in relation to musicology's, musicology's uh, colonial past. Uh, she is moreover the co-author with Burju Yildiz in Turkish of my Heart is Like Those Ruined Houses, Gomidas Vartabed's Musical Legacy, a volume on one of the founders of modern musicology. In 2017, while a visiting scholar at MIT, Bilal co-launched the annual Feminist Armenian Studies Workshop and co-founded the Feminist Armenian Research Collective, a FEM ARC, with Dr. Lerna Ekmekciolu. Ekmekjiolu and Bilal are also the co-editors of the book called A Cry for Justice, Five Armenian Feminist Writers from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic of Turkey, 1862 to 1933 in Turkish and are now collaborating on a work titled Feminism in Armenian, an interpretive anthology and digital archive. This is a book in progress through Stanford University Press and the Digital Humanities Project and focuses on 12 Armenian feminist writers who were active in the Ottoman and post-Ottoman contexts in their diasporas. Dr. Bilal is currently working on her monograph in uh, tentatively titled Wake Up Lullaby, colon, Gendered Politics of indigeneity, music, and memory in the late Ottoman Armenian revolutionary imagination. And the ethnographic research project, the injuries of reconciliation being Armenian in Turkey. So without further delay, allow me now to invite my friend Melissa Bilal to the floor. And uh, I look forward to this lecture. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Cebu, for this kind introduction. Thanks, Anne and Hospik, for organizing this event as a part of Women's History Month and Genocide Commemoration. And I'd like to also thank the co-sponsors. I'm not going to read them, their name uh, again. Um, so thank you. Let me share my screen. On August 11, 1903, Mari Beylerian and Abedist Avo Nakushtian got married in exile in Egypt. A few days after the wedding ceremony hosted in their Alexandria home, Mari shared the news in Ardemis, the journal she had been editing and publishing for about over a year. The announcement placed at the bottom right corner of the last page read that Avo chose to adopt his spouse's last name to be known as Mr. Beylerian from then on. This exceptional reversal of patriarchal, patrilineal naming norm is not totally surprising when one thinks of the revolutionary beginnings of Mari's life path. September 30th, 1895, Sunday. 
an 18 year old partisan rushes to Kumkapı, to the Armenian main cathedral of Constantinople and the patriarchal seat. With a red scarf around her neck to be recognized by her comrades, the fervent revolutionary leads them to Patriarch Mateos Izmirlian to call for his urgent appeal to the Ottoman state to implement the promised measures to stop the calamitous mistreatment of Armenians in the capital and in the provinces. Historiography on Armenian revolutionary movement remembers Mari Beylerian's name by this memorable speech she gave in what we would later be what would later be known as the legendary Baba Ali demonstration, one of the most important rallies demanding justice for Armenians in the Ottoman lands. That day, masses joined the protesters chanting a revolutionary song and proceeded to present a list of grievances to the government. A pogrom against Armenians in the city ensued. Years later, in a poem dedicated to late Archbishop Izmirlian, Mari was going to reflect regretfully on the bloody suppression of the march and the violence against Armenians. That day also marked the beginning of Mari's life as a person on Angrata in the eyes of the Ottoman state. Mari lived a short but robust life, committed to Armenian people's liberation, women's emancipation until she disappeared amidst the horrors of the genocide. Today, my talk focuses on Mari Beylerian. This paper is an early version of a chapter I'm writing for the book, Feminism in Armenian and Interpretive Anthology, co-authored by Lernek Mekciolo of MIT History. And this uh, cover is imaginary, some kind of a draft of a book cover we came up with. The chapter in our book includes a selection of Mari's original texts, mainly political essays, translated into English by Jeffrey Michael Goshkarian. And throughout the presentation today, whenever I read, I read a quote from Mari, it will be his translations uh, for our book. On that note, I would also like to acknowledge Victoria Rowe and Lernaik Mekciolo for opening up the scholarly discussion on Mari Beylerian's life and work by their earlier, earlier publications, and Arpine Haroyan's precious efforts of bringing Mari Beylerian into public visibility in Armenia through her EVN report blog from the forgotten pages of history and her recent public lecture to school teachers in Yerevan. And Arpine Haroyan is also working with us in this project as our research assistant now. Today, no one knows where that indefatigable woman soldier of the idea fell, noted Theotic in his 1921 biography of Mari Beylerian, which provided a unique document of her legacy. According to scarce information scattered across sources, Mari was born in Besiktas in March 10, 1877, and educated at Esayan School and Peras Arhestanot, Peras uh, School for the Arts and Crafts. While still a student on the initiative of her mentor, the well-known clergyman and ethnographer Karekin Cervantiant, she began teaching Armenian language history and religion at the same Arhestanot. In her writings, Beylerian always presented this institution, the Arhestanos, as a successful example of the vocational school model for Armenian girls' education. Mari also taught at her other alma mater, the, that is Esaya. Mari's involvement with the Social Democrat Hunchagyan Party was formalized when she began working as a correspondent for its official organ, Hunchak. She would soon form a women's group, organize secret operations, seek the support of foreign missions for her imprisoned comrades, facilitate their escape from the country, and take care of their kids in their absence. She often had to go underground, especially after her involvement as an organizer in the Baba Ali demonstration I mentioned earlier. She escaped her surrounded house after the 1896 Bank Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Bank occupation. When the government issued a death sentence on her, she was already in Egypt. 
In Egypt, Mari continued her teaching career at Alexandria's Bogostian and Kairos Korenian schools. The latter became Kalustian after 1907. In 1906, she chaired Kairos, Usub Nasser Armenufiat Santukht Ngerutyun, that is Saint Santukht Philomatic Society of Armenian Women, an organization founded to support provincial Armenian girls' education in the homeland and in Egypt. In 1909, after the restoration of the Ottoman constitution, Mari and Avo returned to the Ottoman mainland. Mari started working as the principal of Ripsimyan's girls' school in Izmir. In August 1914, sorry, uh, in August 1914, the couple moved to Tokat, Yevdokia, neighboring Avo's birthplace, Sivas, where he had been working as a teacher before he fled the country because of his revolutionary activities as a Hujar activist. They were both appointed to reform the local Armenian school in Tokat, but when the war broke, uh, when the war broke out, their salaries were cut. Before completing their first academic year, the Armenian genocide began. The government deported the couple along with their colleagues, students, parents, and the whole town's Armenians. The Balearian couple fell victim under unknown conditions. Mari's writing career began under the pen name Galipso, Calypso, while she was still a student. But I will jump ahead and take you to January 1902 when she founded Artemis in Cairo, which later uh, is going to be moved to Alexandria. This women's review that you see the first issue on the screen, I argue was an Armenian feminist response to the global first wave of women's emancipation movement. Throughout its lifetime, Ardemis printed articles in which women's struggle in Europe and the US were praised. Women's liberation cause was defined as an international fight. The journal itself was referred to as a feminist organ by its contemporaries, yet Mari was in constant creative tension with the term feminist and the manifestations of it in the West, or at least the way Mari perceived them. Mari conceived her monthly as an independent publication that provided Armenian women with the means to unreservedly express their opinions on social matters impacting their lives. By doing so, Armenian women were going to intervene in the decisions made on their behalf, and she called them to get organized around this paper and to claim their place in the world and in the nation and to defend this collective space against bigots' attacks. Artemis's pages testify that women indeed did in fact feel empowered by writing and by having a space to counter the public misrepresentations of their sex. They spoke up against progressive male intellectuals complicity in the continuous gender injustice in the Armenian community. They spoke against the common discourse of beautiful and tender sex, against gender inequality in pay, against the underappreciated social work of nuns, and finally, against the most taboo subject of domestic violence and the victim blaming attitude of Armenian communities governing bodies. From the onset, Mari acknowledged Avo as her greatest collaborator in realizing this dream. Avo did not only travel to Echmiazin, which was then in Russian empire, to solicit Catholicos Magadich Kharimian's help in raising funds to start up Artemis's publication, he also became, but he also became a regular contributor in the journal, Avo. By granting the manuscript and the copyrights of a collection of his poems, Kharimian Hayrik provided the financial support essential to initiate Artemis, which Mari acknowledged in the opening pages of the first issue. Kirimian's Verchalusi Tsainer, Sounds of Twilight, was published in 1901 with Mari's preface, and the revenue was used to fund Artemis. In this organ of the 20th century Armenian woman, 
Mari allocated pages to articles, translations, and correspondences by women and men about Armenian and non-Armenian women's social status, labor and political rights, and the condition of female education in different parts of the world. Having come out at a time marked by repressions against Armenian life in the Ottoman Empire under the rule of the autocratic Sultan Abdulhamid II, this monthly of family and literature, as she called it, also became a new channel for Armenians to connect their literary and cultural life across communities while enjoying pieces of a re-flourishing Armenian literature. Ardemus's audience was predominantly in the Caucasus and other parts of the Russian Empire, but also in Balkans, Iran, Cyprus, Egypt, Europe, and the US. Moreover, the prohibition on its circulation in the Ottoman mainland did not prevent it from reaching there as well. Uh, confirm, as confirmed by the information we read on its pages, such as the news about people donating the issues of the journal to Ottoman Armenian girls' schools. However, although it found a broad reception, reaching near 700 subscribers at the end of the first year, Mari experienced difficulties in collecting the subscription fees, an issue she repeatedly brought up. The announced third year never saw the light of the day and Artemis ceased publication after its last issue in December 1903. The fact that a male writer of the time compared its destiny, compared Artemis's destiny with that of French feminist paper, La Fronde, is remarkable in terms of its impact on its contemporaries. After Artemis, Mari's pen found its home in Azad Pem, Free Stage, an Alexandria on Cairo-based organ, where along with other Armenian political dissenters against the Ottoman state, she actively wrote on anti-Armenian violence and the Armenian resistance, especially bringing in women's experiences and voices into visibility. When she moved to Izmir, Mari became one of the main contributors of Tashing Daily. And here you, uh, I was looking for this photo earlier, a uh, beautiful photo of Mari as the principal of Surprip Simians in Izmir, surrounded by her students on the occasion of her departure from Izmir. When she moved to Izmir, Mari became one of the main contributors of Tashing daily. Uh, Tashing means alliance in Armenian. And in 1914, her collected work in the form of essays, speeches, and literary poetry and prose, mainly revised versions of the previously published works and the plays she penned for school performances came out under the title Tebivesh, 1914 Izmir. Quote, in every century and at all times, men have always had a free, broad arena before them, an arena for speaking, thinking, writing, and acting. In contrast, a very limited condition, a very constrained life has been created for women. I mean, in particular, Armenian women. End of quote. Quote again, it is not just in, Arme in the Armenian nation, but in all nations in general that women led the same sad, flatter fettered life. We can cite as rare exceptions, a few scattered nations in which women live more or less as creatures with a free conscience, free con convictions and free ideas. End of quote. I'm going to read a couple of quotes from her that I like. Quote, women were told, you will be born, marry, give birth to children in your turn and die like grass, like vegetation, leaving the world unnoticed. You have no other calling. The domain open to you is in the family home, but you are not free to act as you wish there either. You shall take orders and act in accordance with them. You have no right to act in ways that seem to you better and more auspicious because you are long on hair but short on brains. 
If she loved, she arranged to bury that love in the deepest recesses of her heart and soul as a moral blemish, as a betrayal of the principles of honor and a manifest sacrilege, sacrilege ultimately as a crime. The thought, what will people say, has always been women's greatest horror and dismay. She is terrified by public opinion the way one is terrified by the gallows." Unquote. An overall evaluation of Marie's body of work attests that she was an unapologetic defender of freedom for women. Although she refrained from calling herself a feminist, and I will explain why, her active struggle for social change for the betterment of women's condition of oppression makes her a staunch feminist. Mary, Marie believed in the urgent necessity of taking action to raise Armenian women's consciousness to their humanly calling and to empower them to take up their part in the world. She refuted the justification of women's restrained status and lack of rights by an arg argument of their mental inferiority. She stated that women had never have access to the structural conditions to prove their intellectual capacity. Moreover, ages old oppression forced women to think that they were created to be nothing but slaves. Mari strongly opposed women's confinement to home, took issue with the moral conventions that denigrated those who joined the public life and workforce alongside men. She promoted women's economic independence as a matter of dignity, essential for her emancipation, and the only way female sex could change its status of the unwelcome offspring or a commodity. At the same time, she criticized the downgraded value of unpaid domestic labor and strongly opposed to the idea that women who did not earn a salary were passive consumers. Mari's perspective on female employment was firmly anchored in her anti-capitalist consciousness. Laboring classes, that is the majority of the Armenian population, were at the center of her discussion. While advocating for more women in professions such as medicine, law, literature, arts, and education, she repeatedly brought up the importance of providing economically underprivileged or and, and or rural young women with access to the training and the means to use innovative technologies in manual labor intensive jobs. Marie's writings on women's employment were controversial as she fell into the conservative trap of deeming certain jobs as essentially unfit for women's uh, physical composition and honor. She was in fact criticized for this. She was criticized for her ideas about restricting women's areas of occupation. But she responded to these criticisms by arguing that it was not due to conservatism on her part, but rather due to, due to a conviction that she had that men, it was on men to take immediate action to create the employment conditions where women won't be confined to jobs designed to objectify or exploited, exploit their sexuality. So more, more jobs for women. Of course, she's talking about prostitution and she was in agreement with the Marxist idea that prostitution, which she saw as a moral demise, resulted from economic deprivations rather than essential lack of virtue. Similarly, in accordance with the philosophical currents of her time, she believed in the evolution of human moral life. The fallen woman for her was someone who was robbed of her rights instead of like essentially uh, corrupt, morally corrupt, somebody who was robbed of her rights, privileges, education, and means of survival. As moralist thinker, she argued for justice, freedom, and equality as prerequisites to responsibility and integrity. As a continuation of this stance, like Armenian feminists of her time, 
she problematized misogynistic, what today we call misogynistic codes of honor and the use of them to control women's lives. According to Mari Beylerian, living a passive life incompatible with one's humanly calling, like confining yourself to home and, and like be passive and accepting conditions of oppression without questioning them was not a sign of high morality. Mari defined the family as the last remaining uncontaminated sphere of human relations. She attributed women the noble call to save the future of their communities by their actions within domestic space. Quote, its mother's influence remains indelibly imprinted on her child's heart and soul. Let us therefore know how to instill the good, the beautiful, the useful in children at all times. Let us bear in mind that whole generations will owe us their greatness." Uncle. Thus, while from time to time falling into the problematic place of holding women accountable for the next generations and a whole people's moral integrity, Mari redefined motherhood as a position of social agency and political power. This also helped her contest the allegations that women were morally and intellectually weak by nature and are therefore bound to be subordinate. Quote, let us have the right to speak freely and boldly to express our opinion about every problem bearing on social life. And let us demand that our opinions to be taken into account and that our ideas be treated with respect, unquote. Women were to love freely and choose their own partners and have total freedom in the family while also dedicating themselves to good social causes. Quote, let us be free in our family, free and independent in the way we act and think. Let us be free to pursue any cherished idea or any purpose dear to us, free in a word, in everything that is permitted by a pure morality entirely free of prejudice and that does not undermine the work of ennobling the younger generation. Let us not go beyond this limit. Let us remain willingly and gladly in our sacrosanct role, bearing in mind that the greatest satisfaction and the greatest happiness reside in unimpeachably fulfilling one's duty." Uncle. In this formulation, as you see, women's duty to the young generation, both as mothers and educators, as teachers, is the limit of women's freedom. So this duty is both binding, controlling, regulating women's lives and choices, and at the same time, liberating, agency and legitimacy granting, and thus empowering, a feminine narrative in the turn of the 20th century feminist literature. So I will come back to this, but I want to rewind now, back now and dwell a little bit more on Marie Beylerian's formulation of the family as the last remaining uncorrupted space of human life and dignity thanks to women's essential moral superiority and efforts. Marie criticized men for their moral failure for their inability to remain loyal in their life, love, for seducing women, for merely sexual pleasure, for manipulating the discourse of freedom, to hunt women for their sexual desires while benefiting from keeping them uneducated and submissive. Marie was also very vocal in her rejection of the convention that regarded marriage and reproduction as the only purpose of a woman's life. She stood for the legalization of divorce to prevent unhappy marriages, unhappy families in case of failure of parts in fulfilling their spousal and parental responsibilities. Marie's point of reference or theoretical framework, if you like, to understand the concepts of freedom and justice was enlightenment philosophy, of course, and its feminist critique. Like many feminists of her time, she too used the ideas of 18th century European liberal thinkers 
and put them into practice by following the feminist critique of inalienable rights of the individual that no outside entity, in this case, not only the Ottoman government, but also the power holders of the Armenian community could intrude. She joined other feminists in disrupting the gender dichotomy of rational versus irrational. She repeatedly wrote about the significance of sentiments and moral and ethical judgments in social and political life. She rejected a man's world that was corrupt and ugly and celebrated women's strategically essentialized life and caregiving capacity. Her idea of a social life built on feminine characteristics has many commonalities, of course, with that of her contemporaries elsewhere who took the celebrating women's difference path in feminism and reinterpreted women's reproductive capacity and affective labor as basis of potential political power. Quote, it is an undeniable fact that men have totally fallen morally a thousand times lower than women. The reason is the unrestrained freedom that he has enjoyed for centuries. If woman had been given in full the right to walk at her companion's side down all of life's paths as his equal, as we have said on another occasions as well, today the only humanity in existence in the world would be enslaved to its passions, living by animal instincts alone. Nature, however, infinitely lofty and infinitely wise, has by designating women as a reliable, sure guardian of human reason, been the first to refuse her that equal freedom. Destining women for the condition of motherhood, it has, the nature, first thwarted in her all the tendencies in which an immoral nature lies concealed, and to make that yoke sweet for her, to make that burden light and protect her from abominable forms of degradation has put the child in her bosom and lap. So according to Marie, men, by granting the license for acting on their natural instincts, animal instincts, without restricting them by reason, judgment, and common sense, harm the society. But preventing women from acting on the same instincts was the mothering responsibilities they had. While Marie seemed to be employing a biological determinist discourse, she also built her argument on dialectical materialism. Of course, this discourse that has such a great potential of a feminist opening closes with the conservative paradigm, uh, and I guess not very different than other dialectical materialists of her time. And the practical implications of this discourse gets tamed by the real politics imposed by the condition of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. Mari argues that Armenian men have to understand and accept that women deserve equal freedom, but Armenian women should choose to retreat, to put their moral superiority and reproductive capacity into practice for the sake of Armenian nation's survival. So I will come back to this point too and elaborate more about Mari's uh, idea of an Armenian feminism. But in order to conclude my discussion on Marie's subversion of the moralistic discourse, I would like to draw your attention to her reversal of the gender binary of body, mind, nature, culture. According to Marie, men acted on their natural unrestrained instincts, whereas women acted on reason. And moreover, this is women's nature. Of course, by arguing that women are essentially morally superior and ethically firm, Marie's reasoning can very well work against women, themsel women themselves because it defines normative behavior for female sexuality, heteropatriarchal uh, norms, and Marie makes childcare the uncontestable obligation of women. So these are the conservative part. But on the other hand, it forms solid ground to defend women's liberation by invalidating any counterattack that uses female sexuality as a weapon against women. Similarly, Marie's take on of Christian theology has its unique feminist layers in terms of its interpretation of sin and redemption. In both her literary pieces and essays, Marie comes across as an anti-capitalist anti Christian thinker 
who preaches humility and righteousness, taking stands with the people, even when they commit crimes, to, resort, to reverse the crimes committed against them by their abusers. So if you kill a landlord, you're not in sin. Her, her writings testify to her strong devotion as a practicing Christian, but one who is critical of civilized, quote unquote, Christian nations, hypocrisy towards Armenian suffering, or the Armenian aristocracy for exploiting people and criminalizing those who fight for justice, for example, Armenian revolutionaries, or the Armenian learned elite, learned elite for diverging from the path of modesty and selfless service. So she used, used Christian theology to criticize, to basically further her anti-elite, anti anti-capitalist uh, thinking. Mari brings up the issue of femicide. In the name of honor and money, she writes women saints, nuns, and hymn writers back to the history of Christianity. And her God is one who empowers a woman to run away with her kid from her abusive husband. The most powerful tool of Mari's feminism is education. And what defines her the best is her work as educator, Tastiarag, a title she preferred to refer herself with. Throughout her life, she not only served as a teacher and administrator, but also actively wrote on philosophy of education, methods of pedagogy, principles of an Armenian revolutionary education, how to better girls' education, girls' schools curricula, how to expand, extend equal education opportunities to the female sex and the students from economically deprived families. Aside from her articles and poems addressed to her students, we have a number of speeches Mari delivered as the principal at Hrib Simeon's uh, school, printed in the Tashin uh, and later in uh, Tebube. It's obvious that Mari harbored motherly love for her students. She saw them as the only hope for the future. She advised these young women to be strong, hardworking, and principled and to always value sisterhood. Kawarati, that is provincial women, occupy a central role in Mari's formulation of army women's liberation. Maybe even more than any other feminist of her time, perhaps because she remained in touch. She was in the provinces herself in person. She remained in touch with the provincial Armenian population and never ceased calling Armenians in urban centers to turn attention to the on ongoing massacres or economic violence that the provincial population was experiencing. Raising consciousness among Kawarati women to break their ignorance that serves to bind them with the chains of quote unquote backward customs, causing them misery is a theme repeated in her fiction, literary fiction as well. While seeing herself a pioneer of social progress, Marie in Ardennes and elsewhere voiced out her critique of an, any developmentalist ambition or technological advance that leaves a whole social class deprived from the means of improving their conditions. Marie's opposition to unselectively adopting European lifestyle by following popular trends and her discourse of seeing it as loss of values surely parallels with similar anxieties over, over westernization voiced out in the Ottoman Empire during in Tanzimat novel and uh, later throughout the Ottoman modernization period. But her critique is more focused on opposing capitalists and she's very vocal about uh, her writings on ca capitalism, opposing capitalist development at the expense of ethical principles and a sense of community rather than conservatism. Mari's overall project was finding a genuine Armenian feminist path. She pursued the women's emancipation question, Gnoch Azadakutian Hartse, as a major revolution in the society towards the better and the sacred right. But she also believed that contemporary idioms of the European feminism had elements that were not well suited for the Armenian women's social condition and failed to address the essential rights Armenian women needed 
in order to overcome the current injustices they faced in their lives. Quote, let us not confuse the demand of the Armenian women question with the cause of European women's liberation. European and Armenian women differ fundamentally from each other. One demands absolute possession of social rights and civic equality after having already enjoyed all the conditions that come with being a free creature. The other, in contrast, wants to call attention to her familiar and familial and individual enslavement and become the equal of her male companion by demanding her natural rights from him. Why should the natural world demand of the Armenian woman question be tied to that of, a, of the European women's liberation question? A very natural question arises before us here. We base it on a consideration of racial specificity. Are people not individual before they are communal? And do the interrelations that the distinct nations must have with each other not come under the same rule? Specificity, in our opinion, is the natural law of the world. For us, this foundation must become, from the interrelational standpoint, the principal guide and foundation whenever we examine the various facets of our question of Armenian women. Or at least, when we set out to cultify, cultivate the Armenian women question by means of grafts from European women's healthy principles, let us not slavishly adopt all of European women's demands since they are not appropriate for us, or since we cannot yet dream of even the most probable possibility of feeling the need to raise all their demands." Unquote. Maria also thought that the feminist movement was diverging from its consciousness for, of reversing women's trampled rights. She warned against the current tendencies of making revenge the main goal of the feminist cause. She fell into the trap of perceiving unbound freedom as women sacrificing their families at the expense of their selfish pleasures. But again, this was very much materialized in Armenian condition because she always maintained her firm belief in women's legitimate right to demand equality and enjoy unbound freedom. But she also believed that the Armenian race couldn't afford such a thing both because of its fragile situation and because of Armenian women's unpreparedness. Armenian women had to create their own feminism, endorse it, own it, come to a consciousness level to diagnose their problems and formulate their own demands and fight for them in an organized manner. And Armenian women's organized action should be supported by Armenian men. Code. We have often said that Armenian women must at all costs melt the ice of her destiny, must wipe the filth of the centuries from her brow. It is however possible to do so only by calling on the united collected forces of the race. The coat of filth is thick and the ice seems to be eternal. A foreigner's pick and shovel are not capable of excavating that massive pile of filth. And the foreigner's burning sun is power powerless to play the role of even one feeble ray in melting the permafrost that debases Armenian women's brow. If Armenian women's authentic voice fails to ring out, if Armenian women's heart does not be sound, and if her own hand does not fly to her wounded heart, to smear it with the salutary bomb, we are lost. And it will be no use calling feminism to the rescue." Unquote. The native feminism, Mari and Vision for Armenian women entailed preserving what was good in Armenian tradition, in quotation marks, of course, by cleansing it of patriarchal practices that enslaved women for ages. And I find it very important because in Armenia, Today, whenever we say that we are feminist, uh, this argument of like uh, Armenian tradition is used against feminism. And in early 20th century, Mari said, a native Armenian feminism should keep the good part in Armenian tradition, which is not patriarchy. Mari 
used history to formulate the specific experience of being an Armenian woman and made connections within, between past and the present to argue for a genuine path for Armenian women's liberation. In doing this, she powerfully deconstructed the discourse that, that sanctified the traditional Armenian family. To this day, we have this problem, sanctification of traditional Armenian family. Quote, there have been periods in which Armenian women had no claims to the inheritance left by their grandparents, parents, and brothers. They were despised creatures, denied even the most elementary human rights, as if they were not rational, feeling, thinking, and acting beings, uncle. And by arguing that the often cited chroniclers only documented upper class women, you know, we hear this argument that Armenian women were once like free before foreign domination and then the foreign powers came and Armenian women uh, were enslaved. Mari made a sovereign human intervention to the nationalist grand narrative that Armenian women used to enjoy extensive rights prior to foreign domination. Quote, our historians have said almost nothing about women of the popular Jogobustain class. And there you see her um, you know, left, anti-capitalist, anti-elite, pro-people stance. Um, I, I, I don't want to call her a socialist yet, although she was part of a party that uh, called itself socialist, because she never uses the word socialist, but she clearly uh, situates herself as anti-capitalist. So socialist or communist, I mean, we can very easily say um, she was uh, anti-capitalist as a over like umbrella term I'm using. But her idea of preserving the good included fighting against the dissolution of family, which she believed Armenian feminists did not care for. She rather advocated for transforming the family into a place of freedom and happiness for women. For example, as I explained earlier, by saving it from men's ambitions of sex, money, and power. In order to better situate Mari Beylerian's Armenian feminist thought, it is important to remember that she was one of the prominent thinkers of the Armenian revolution. In an earlier lecture I discussed, and I will not go uh, in length to this, and I will conclude soon. In an earlier lecture, I discussed in length that she was vocally anti-capitalist and anti-militarist. So uh, I will not get into the details today, but suffice to say that she regarded capitalism as a form of slavery and the enemy of an honorable life. Similarly, she had a well-defined stance against the war machine and its rootedness in governments power-seeking ambitions rather than fulfilling their duty to the welfare of their citizens. While theorizing the difference between military offense and people's right to self-defense, which is very relevant to, to the discussions we have today, Mari showcased women's decisive role in revolutions, in changing the course of history, thus shaping a people's destiny. She gives examples from um, women freedom fighters. She wrote about Armenian women from the past and also from the recent revolutionary struggle, including her own comrades or her comrades in the Hunchak party. She also made reference to Harriet Beecher Stowe and the American abolitionist movement. And I will not get into the details of the criticism that we have to Harriet Beecher Stowe and, and um, uh, that literature, but back in the day, they saw Harriet Beecher Stowe as um, this like virtuous woman from the Christian tradition who was, um, who was an abolitionist uh, writer. And she saw Arme American women's rights activist, Alice Stone Blackwell, the daughter of Susan Anthony's well-known uh, American feminist, Susan Anthony's mentor, Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone's daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, Mari considered her as the Harriet Beecher Stowe of Armenians. Blackwell, Blackwell connection is very interesting because earlier Blackwell uh, had heard about Artemis through her friends in Boston, Boston Armenian community, and reached out to Marie in Egypt from Boston. And in two separate issues of Artemis, Marie introduced Blackwell 
to her readers, printed the Armenian translation of uh, a Christina Georgina Rossetti poem and life story Blackwell Center, and gave space to Blackwell's announcement about the newly founded organization, Friends of Armenia, which was collecting articles in Armenian to be translated into English and published in the US media with the purpose of spreading accurate information on Armenians. So in conclusion, Mari's feminism was shaped In conclusion, Mari's feminism was shaped in response to fighting on two fronts. One, protecting the Armenian national revolution from submitting itself to the hegemony of an internationalist agenda. Two, securing the Armenian people's survival against the economic and political oppressions they endured in the Ottoman Empire. Thus, Armenian women had to rise up, get organized, liberate themselves from men, and Armenian men had to accept that Armenian women are deserving and capable of enjoying equal freedom. But both women and men also had obligations towards their enslaved nation, which was in a constant struggle against assimilation and annihilation. Men had impediments that hindered them from fully fulfilling this duty. So it was on the shoulders of women to put their liberties in the service of their people. They had the power and the responsibility of giving birth taking care of, educating the future generation and securing the survival of the Armenian people. Quote, let enjoying a freedom fully equal to men's not be our sole objective. That would be a very ordinary aspiration, smacking only of extreme egotism. Rather, let our principle be mainly the elevation of our nation, our poor nature, nation, always threatened by the terrible danger of assimilation into the bigger, the stronger nation. As Mari repeatedly stated, Armenian women also had the power and responsibility of becoming public intellectuals, social activists, and revolutionary fighters. Mari's feminism's prophetic element was to attribute women the right and duty of taking active part in their people's persistence to exist. A heavy responsibility successfully fulfilled by Armenian feminists who, unlike her, were lucky enough to survive the collective and state violence against Armenians. These feminists, her sisters, put the infrastructures and networks they had created for decades to advance women's education and empowerment, now into the service of genocide survivors, including the overwhelming number of orphans they saved, took care of, and educated. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa. This was uh, a wonderful and comprehensive talk. We all learned so much. I think we can now go to our uh, questions, our Q&A. Um, let's see, Sebu, would you like to ask the first question? I think you need to unmute. We don't have too many questions, so I will, I will kick kickstart the conversation by uh, posing a couple of questions to Melissa myself, if I can. Uh, first, thank you so much for that really stimulating uh, um, detailed talk. Uh, I learned much from this conversation and lecture. So uh, my questions are twofold. The first one is straightforward, basically. Uh, and that is that uh, given the parallels between Mari uh, uh, Beilerian's life and the life of another distinguished woman who was very active in the revolutionary movement and was her contemporary, namely Mari, Maro Vardanyan or Nazar Bekian, as she is most prominently known, a co-founder of the Hunchak party in Geneva, of course, as you know. Uh, the first question I have is, do you know if there were any interactions between the two of them? And if so, what those interactions were like would be the first question. The second question is a bit more convoluted even to myself, but I'll try to make uh, as much sense of it as possible. And that is that uh, I couldn't help but to uh, read into your talk and see the importance of obviously two very important ideologies or discourses in Mari Beilerian's life. One being nationalism or the nation and the other one of course, being the woman question 
and uh, feminism. So as you know, uh, I'm sure, um, scholars like Partha Chatterjee and others have noted that anti-colonial nationalisms have usually approached the women's question using a kind of binarism of the spiritual versus the material, the two kind of worlds, and they have positioned women in the spiritual world that deals with domestic life, where women are responsible for uh, ensuring that the nation survives by their procreative uh, roles and so forth. And so this kind of conservative undertone has uh, in some ways uh, restricted uh, the role of uh, feminism from a nationalist perspective and has made the relationship between nationalism and feminism one that is fraught with difficulties and problems. So my question to you is, do you see any way of reading Beilerian's uh, thinking through the prism, uh, let's say somebody like Partha Chatterjee in terms of the dichotomy of spiritual versus material, et cetera, et cetera, and whether you think Marie was herself aware of this contradiction in these two ideologies or discourses that she was trying to embrace in her own life? And if so, uh, how did she deal with this uh, tension between these two uh, uh, discourses? Great question. Thank you very much. Like that's the theoretical opening that I wanted to uh, have the discussion. So uh, the first question, the obvious question, uh, her relations with the Hunchak founders and activists. Unfortunately, we don't know. And that's the direction. I mean, I wanted to go, uh, but I couldn't find many, as I said, Armenian revolutionary historiography only mentions her name in Arsene Gidur's book uh, with the, as a young revolutionary who gave that talk. And it is not until Teotik, and I don't even know how Teotik knew about her, uh, that, you know, Teotik wrote a huge volume on the Armenian intellectuals who fell victim to the genocide. And she, he forgot Mari Beylerian. And after publishing that book, he writes in 1921 to his uh, almanac that, oh, I'm sorry that I forgot this kind of giant name who was Mari Beylerian. And he kind of puts together this unique, very rare, I almost want to say the only biography of Mari Beylerian. And we know many details of Mari Beylerian's life from uh, Teotic's kind of, the, really like Teotic's uh, the efforts of documenting Ottoman Armenian life are huge. So that's through him that we know uh, Mari Beylerian. And it's important to note that Teotic was married to Arsha Guhi. Arsha Guhi is one of the 12 Armenian feminist women that we feature in our book. So there is an organic connection there. So uh, with Maro, really like that, I'm, I, I, that's my dream, I have to say, to find correspondence or any kind of like uh, document that testifies to their communication. I'm sure there, there is. I mean, I haven't, uh, I, I obviously I didn't write a book or a chapter on Mari and the Hunchak party, but if one day someone wants to do that, ha that person has to go to the archives, to, to Geneva, to, I mean, I'm, I'm reading the secondary sources, but that's totally worth researching. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot, like one has to be, one has to write a book on Mari Beylerian, make a documentary about Mari Beylerian, fiction, uh, feature film, so yeah, that part of like the, the relation with the Hunchak party is very important because also she, I mean, it's obvious that her involvement with the party didn't end with that, um, with, uh, end there. He, she actually was uh, labeled as persona non grata because of her revolutionary activities and, and involvement with the party and that, that changed her life. So she had to flee to Egypt and she married another Hunchak activist, which is Avo. So obviously they remained as Hunchak uh, activists, revolutionaries until the end of their life. So, but unfortunately she doesn't write about that. That's the problem. She doesn't write about that and we don't know, but that's a 
important like a kind of uh, research project that I would gladly um, pursue in the future. The other question, the burning question, yes, it's actually kind of almost like the formative question of my intellectual kind of uh, formation development because I started my career at Bolt University in a department where in every kind of class we read post-colonial literature. Basically like, you know, Foucault, Marx, Foucault, Althusser, Gramsci, and the post-colonials. That's all we read, and the Frankfurt School. So my intellectual formation is very much like seeing everything from that post-colonial perspective. And not only Chatterjee, but uh, it's important to note that uh, post-colonial feminism shaped like my uh, African-American, like black feminist thought, native, like uh, Native American, Native Canadian feminist thought, uh, indigenous feminist thought, and post-colonial feminist thought. Uh, it's kind of like the intellectual basis of my, the way I read things. In terms of nationalism, uh, I have two criticisms, like we have in, in this book with Dernaik Mekcioolo, that's actually the theoretical framework of our book. So almost the last two, three decades since we were born, I have to say, we have been reading texts that evaluate feminist movements, especially in 1960s, like Middle Eastern, like Middle Eastern feminist uh, movement is very much theorized within the nationalist paradigm. Uh, Jaya Bardena's uh, kind of uh, iconic uh, groundbreaking work um, tells us about uh, women and nationalism. Actually, I have a sense that we have a sense that like there is nothing new to be said about women and nationalism in the Middle East and in, in the, the kind of the colonized world. Uh, and yes, that's true. Like uh, women, like nationalist projects were using women for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, so everything has been, I guess, said. But my, our problem with that after coming like years and years of thinking about this, one observation is that when it comes to the feminist movement, uh, and now it's more interesting for us than the other right now, without denying, of course, the theoretical framework and the openings that that literature, like feminism and nationalism in the Middle East and the, the colonized world uh, in India mainly, uh, granted us. Uh, we never talk about the nationalism of white uh, feminists. Like we, it is, a, it is new literature, new and fresh literature that why we, when we are talking about feminism and nationalism, why it is only like the Middle East and India, but not France, because French feminists were also nationalists. British, now I am, we are more interested in reading texts that talk about British suffragettes and how much they were invested in their own nationalist white like colonial nationalist agendas and they used uh the, the colonialist discourse to further their feminist demands say like if you don't give us our rights we we will look like indian women that you know completely like justifying the colonial project of britain england uh in india so they 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 used like racist kind of uh, frameworks to basically against Indian women to further their uh, feminist goals. So it's it's very, I think now the, the instead of like uh, dividing it like feminism in the West and the East and in the East or the colonized world, like global South and East, it was more nationalist or nationalism used feminism. Uh, it, now our perspective is more like a global understanding of feminist history. And it is not surprising that in Armenian case, and as much as I, I we like, we read, and we use the conceptual tools of like post-colonial feminism, and that is very useful because for post-colonial feminist writers actually granted us with the tools of seeing uh, Armenian feminism not as a 
uh, as submissive to Armenian nationalism, but as using, as having agency, as, as basically like utilizing that space. Yes, Armenian men from the onset. Uh, and also it's not only like nationalism, but also modern, modern nationalism, like Western oriented, like Western. Uh, so basically our women, I mean, we need to modernize women. We need to educate women. We need to have, we need to give our women some like Westernized modern look to be able to recognize as a European modern nation. So it's like, it's the project. But what Armenian women did with that is more interesting for us because Armenian women, as you saw in the art, like in, in my presentation, I went back and forth, like what sounds conservative, what is progressive, what is like, I don't even want to fall into those categories, like uh, this like mutually exclusive, like dichotomic categories of progressive versus conservative, because it also sounds very anachronistic. But Mari Beylerian was constantly poking, subverting and disrupting these ideas, especially the elitism of farming and nationalism. So that's one thing. Uh, the spiritual versus, uh, obviously like this is a global phenomena and also coming from the West as well. Also the enlight it's also part of the enlightenment feminist critique to bring the spiritual sentimental, like uh, the, the power of it in the political like decision-making uh, processes. Uh, but one last thing like to connect it to your question is we are more and more interested in uh, understanding the beginnings of Armenian feminism, not as a kind of uh, flaw that it happened in Armenian kind of na national liberation imaginations or use the, the terms of it, but as a very natural, like because French feminism started, had its roots in French revolution. American, like Susan and when they wrote the Seneca Falls uh, Declaration, it was a response to American um, Declaration of Independence. So basically, we argue now in the book, because we matured a little bit more, I guess, in, intellectually, to be able to say that it's the 1850s, uh, like mid 19th century, especially like culminated into 1960s, like Armenian constitutional uh, kind of movement within the Ottoman Armenian community and the Ottoman reform made it possible for these women to say, oh, okay, you know, you want to build a secular modern nation that looks like, like something in the West. I mean, uh, we want to be a part of it. So instead of saying that it's a flaw, it's basically kind of, we now want to read Armenian women as integral parts of like that making of that discourse of uh, nationalism. And it's very interesting that it's, it's not a, it's a contested space. Women are in constant fight with the nationalist discourse by men. Like for example, one example in this case is uh, Sibyl, Isabella Sadr is very critical of, yeah, he, she says like, my comrades, Armenian men, you are, uh, you promised us, and it's important to note that Armenian national constitution promised girls, Armenian young women, to receive education. So it's like the, the document of Armenian, let's say like democratization early, like the first Armenian constitution has, a, has an item, has an article that promises uh, Armenian girls, that they will receive education. That's that's a duty. That's a re responsibility of the nation nation's government bodies. Of course, women were not like uh, that stupid or naive. They said, "Oh, okay, you know, you you there's an opening there. Let's get organized." They promised this. Let, let's let's let make let's make them sure that they put it in practice. So it was a constant struggle. But also if, because everything happened with under, that's why it's so similar to like black feminist thought because many, many questions that are uh, discussed in even today, like if you read indigenous feminist critique to white feminism about family and community, you see like incredible parallels. And when I was teaching this uh, Mari Beylerian at, uh, in Armenia, I always asked my, my students to make 
like theoretical kind of comparisons between uh, indigenous, like native uh, feminism and Mari Beylerian's discourse, not to be anachronistic, but to see the, the contextual similarities that Mari uh, constantly like reminded Armenian women that we are in a hierarchical relationship with this um, like bigger nations. And that's why it's very hard. And of course, it, as Lerna Ekmekciola wrote in her book, it's a paradox. It's, uh, it's, it's a constant redefinition. That's why actually it's very, it's still relevant to us today that uh, different theoretical frameworks, we need to bring in different theoretical frameworks to understand and also the specificities. Uh, what was so specific about the Ottoman? One thing very interesting because um, Gayatri Spivak said this once uh, that when the subaltern um, studies group was formed and the post-colonial literature was kind of, uh, you know, in the making, nobody really paid attention to the Ottoman experience. So maybe in this case, I mean, I, we believe that with our book, we're also making uh, an intervention to the discourse on um, how to understand the Ottoman Empire as an empire and uh, the imperial relationship and the imperial space and feminisms in that imperial space and how army women saw themselves. Uh, I don't know, I, I went off yeah. because yeah. it's so thought provoking, but you ask the theoretical question. Thank you so much. That was Thank really you. very informative indeed. Uh, so I will, um, Andy, will, would you like to uh, pick up the question? Sure. I, I will ask um, a little bit of a follow-up question pertaining to the period where Mari was a correspondent for the uh, Hunchak Party publication. And uh, some of us were wondering, some in the Q&A as well, about um, the Hunchak Party's views toward women, did they have a particularly uh, enlightened or different view, say, compared to the other political parties? Was this unique to the Hunchaks? Or maybe you could elaborate on that if you have information. As I said, I didn't, uh, like, I my, my research didn't focus on uh, Mari as a Hunchak activist, but because she doesn't write about that, and because the Hunchak uh, secondary sources uh, don't mention about it. But we know that she, as early as in 1890s, when she was very young, she started uh, a women's organization within the Hunchak party. So that's that's big. And she she names a couple of her female comrades. So there were women who were organized as a like women's unit, obviously under Hunchak party, and they were. Uh, in the decision-making bodies and they were given responsibilities. And actually like, I don't know how, if this is uh, accurate or not because I couldn't verify it in like Hunchak um, kind of literature, but Mar um, Teotik says that Mari was actually uh, the, the leader, like one of the leaders organizing the Bank Ottoman, which we know more like uh, an ARF, a Tashnak Tutun, um, uh, um, action, but uh, he wrote that she was actually like a part of it, and we know that there was like um, there were Hunchak activists as well, and Mari was one of them. So uh, that's really like the that's the beyond that's beyond the scope of our book right now. But um, I know that there are people who want to work on Mari Beylerian and that's one big uh, research project, her involvement with the Hunchak party. And I actually went through the Hunchak uh, publication to, um, to see if she wrote, she continued read, writing, um, her, her name was not there. So that's, that's another thing. Like even when she was a correspondent, that is like accurate information, but even the, because Theotik says that she uh, she worked as a corres Istanbul correspondent and she covered the the Kumkapa uh, protest. I went to the Hunchak uh, issues, but her name was not. I mean, there are obviously news, but her name is not listed. So maybe they were protecting her 
and and this is also a time when she's using a pen name and it was very common among Armenian women, like Anais was using a pen, pen name because Armenian women in the Ottoman Empire were uh, like started using their real names um, later in their lives. So, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have quite a few questions that have come in since we started. So let's try to uh, get to as many of them as possible and uh, uh, be, um, bullet point if we can. Um, uh, question first from Asya Darbinian, uh, and she says, thank you for the fascinating presentation. Uh, the 2018 Velvet Revolution seemingly shifted the feminist discourse in Armenia and among Armenians and created opportunities for educational projects for a change. How important is it in your opinion to educate Armenians in Armenia and elsewhere about these groundbreaking feminist activists and educators. How can this education help us overcome certain troubling stereotypes and practices, for example, as traditional patriarchal ones, especially in today's reality following the destructive war and during the current political upheavals? So uh, I'll let you tackle that quickly if you can, and then I'll yeah. move on. Um, yeah, okay, I'll be quick. It's very important. Uh, Hi, Asya, by the way. And like, this has this is our life's work. I mean, uh, Lerna and I, with our other comrades, sisters, and brothers in Armenia, Armenian diaspora and the world, we are, uh, we are trying to make this connection between past and the present. And be because we believe that it's important, it's empowering. And even the, even the, the mistakes that they, they had, uh, they made and, um, you know, even like some insights. And also the most important thing in Armenia, the, the, the most important sentence is like, uh, there is no such thing that Armenian feminism is a kind of uh, against Armenian family, or I mean, I, I obviously like we don't care if it is or not, but uh, even that statement is wrong uh, because like, um, yeah, Armenian feminism. Armenians use the word feminism uh, as early as in 1890. So we can say that feminism is an Armenian word. I mean, even Uwak Rutun changes over time. So that makes it Armenian, I guess. So anyway, that was the okay. quick quote. Great, thank you. Uh, and I will take one more from the audience and then I'll, I'll pass the baton to you. Um, the question I'm going to choose next is by Talin Grigor. And she says, thank you so much for your valuable work, Melissa. Belerian's global mobility is very interesting and seems to be characteristic of feminism. Could you please elaborate specifically on her works uh, reach to Iranian Armenians, uh, particularly uh, her woman's journal? Yeah, hi, Talin. I had you and Huri in mind when I was like writing my presentation yesterday. Yes, it's so fascinating that uh, I mean, we know that other feminist journals and other Arme Ottoman Armenian women's writings reached uh, Russian Empire and, and Iran. Uh, but this particular, like Ardemis, is very important in that sense because it lists the, the cities in Iran that uh, they had correspondence. So it was officially kind of uh, sent and read in, in Iran. And I can send you a list of cities. Uh, oh, it has a subscribers list at the back? You're saying? Yeah, not so, so, but correspondence. You know, they had a uh, local correspondent, not, not correspondence, mainly like local correspondence slash um, almost like branches, but back in the day, these were Agent. individuals, agents. Yeah, local agents basically who kind of like collected and distributed, maybe distributors even, because also like it, there is the financial side, right? That's why, yes, you, they were agents because Mari was complaining so much that like she had 700 uh, subscribers who never paid their like fees. So that's why like everybody was reading and actually they were sending uh, like letters to her, but they were not paying their fees. So basically there are uh, agents corresponds in different parts of uh, Iran. And I can, I, I will send you and Hori the, the list of uh, cities and the people. Maybe you can kind of actually match those people with your research uh, because we have the names 
who, who were the local agents and correspondents for Artemis in Iran. Maybe if their descendants are still around, we can get yeah, them. Yeah, of course. The, the money yeah. they owe to be there. The money they owe, yeah. Okay, okay. so uh, Anne? Sure. Um, thank you, Melissa. There are a number of questions pertaining to uh, Mari Bailarian's Christian theology, her, her ideas. You've mentioned her relationship with and support from Catholicos uh, Hrimian uh, Heirig. Did she have a specific um, Christian theology herself, connection with the church? Um, can you elaborate a little bit about that? That's really something I am uh, newly exploring uh, because before for me, for us, uh, Mari was uh, an anti-capitalist, uh, a part of a socialist party and like very vocal about uh, class uh, conflict and exploitation. The more we read, uh, I mean, I was kind of like, shocked and fascinating how much she uses Christian theology. Uh, the other women also, the other women that we work, they take issue with, with like, they both collaborate with uh, some progressive clergymen in terms of like women's education, obviously, we you know, uh, but also take a lot of issue with the church. I mean, Hai Ganesh Mark openly wrote about uh, the marriage vows that are uh, you know, sexist and so, Labella Soder, for example, wrote Hoskant Astudo. She addressed God and said, if you were a woman, you know, almost like uh, kind of it's it's a kind of implicit way of writing about the genocide that she basically wrote a, a, a very important poem about like address to words addressed to God. So like these women had kind of uh, a very like creative tension, I want to say, with the church and Christianity and everything. But Mari is so unique in that sense because uh, she comes across as somebody who is like devoted practicing Christian, almost a bit obsessed with Christianity. Uh, and most of her literary fiction talks about God, priests, but I, I feel like she had like deliberately, obsessively, she wanted to correct that uh, that she saw so long in Armenian practice of Christianity, especially like the, the church run by, you know, ambitions of power, money, uh, men, elite men in the community who were, so she brought, that's why I don't know, like one day my dream is now I'm, I started, thanks to Mari, now I started reading about feminist theology. I didn't incorporate it in my talk because I, I'm still exploring. I don't want to, because theology is something I never like read or knew about the idea of sin and uh, redemption are ideas that are very far from my intellectual kind of formation. But it's very interesting to see how uh, for her, uh, when she deliberately wrote about the fact that like prostitution is not sin. And she basically brought all these like Christian kind of, and this actually brings back uh, us back to uh, Sebu's question about spiritually. She basically like brought certain things from that like morality, spirituality field, uh, sphere to like really dialectical materialism. I mean, mm -hmm. she's, she's like almost like liberation theologist. I mean, I wanted to elude it to the title, liberation theologist, but I really, I, I don't want to make any like anachronistic kind of statements, but I really want to know, more, read more about women in the like liberation theology uh, kind of tradition to see how like these feminist interventions and using Christian theology for, uh, as I said, like in my talk, like she has a story where a woman is abused and this is so unique because we're talking about a church structure that almost like um, works against abused women works uh, kind of like victim blames the women who are like sexually harassed and sexually violated and uh, kind of so victims of domestic violence even today. In her case, she writes a story where God, and we don't know if God is men or women, male or female, or I don't know which, um, which gender, so may maybe like genderless, who empowers this woman morally 
to basically like run away from the abusive husband and take legitimately take her uh, child with her. So these are, I mean, I find these, these very important, especially coming from early 20th century. And coming back to Asya's question, like reading these things and um, I always wanted to like design a course about Christianity and feminism in Armenian uh, kind of world, because especially in Armenia, when I was teaching feminism, that was the major kind of uh, backlash I had. Like feminism is against our Christian faith. So like bringing all these like criticism back, especially like a Marxist criticism and feminist criticism, from within the Christian theology is very new to me, but I want to explore more because it's very exciting. Great, thank you. Sebu, would you like to go next or I can ask another? Sure, I can uh, go ahead if you have one. Okay, uh, so we are getting quite a few questions, Melissa. I hope we can ask a, a few of these anyway. Um, so one um, comes from a scholar at UCLA, Dr. Rukin uh, Singel. Uh, you suggested a continuity between the pre and post genocide agenda of Armenian feminism as reflected in Valerian's uh, acumen in vouching for women's responsibility toward the biological and cultural reproduction of the nation. Could you briefly address in what ways the genocide also brought a rupture here or created new strains on how the Armenian feminists negotiated their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the nation or were there changes? Yeah, that's a very good question actually connected to the earlier uh, question. So uh, what we argue in our book in Feminism in Armenia now is uh, Armenian feminism was very much shaped by the responses it had to develop to state violence. So let's say like briefly, if you say it early uh, mid 19th century, uh, Armenian kind of enlightenment movement and revival, renaissance, whatever intellectual is going on. Women want to be a part of it. There's like, oh, now we are a modern secular nation. Let's let's like um, let's use this space to like uh, you know make sure that Armenian nationalism is uh, kind of treating its female and male nationals, all genders um, equally. But what happens is. Like up until the Adana massacre, uh, they start kind of women's organizations. They open schools in remote villages in uh, Eastern Ottoman uh, land and everything. But uh, even during the Abdulhamid period, they know, they read the massacres and the violence against Ar Armenians and the, the censorship and the suppression of um, freedom of expression and uh, I mean Mari has to like uh, flee to Egypt so they are in, some of them are in exile but with the Adana massacre in 1909 because also because it comes right after the restoration the hopes of a revolution in 1908 Armenian feminism completely uh, takes up a new shape that is always like on the almost like this consciousness, this double consciousness of like, and also this connects back to the post-colonial uh, question that like, we want to be free as women. We want to criticize our men. We want, you know, be uh, kind of doing and staying whatever we want. But now like we have to tend our orphans. So everything that they, basically what they saw and especially of course, this is after the genocide. It's it's taking totally like different a turn, and this is their like McJoel's book and uh, work that all these women who I mean, Armenian feminism in the Ottoman Empire couldn't uh, couldn't follow a let's say natural feminist path because of the state violence they had to because they didn't you know they didn't have a state of their own to basically. Uh, give them like rights, voting rights, or like like in France or in in Britain, but they had a state that was working against them, killing their own subjects. Basically, all the 
uh, the students, the provincial army women that they wanted to empower and enlighten, quote unquote, were now killed. So basically uh, what I want to say is that, right, of, uh, and one important thing in here uh, that uh, Lerna has this beautiful title says, um, can feminists survive, uh, can, can feminists survive and revive a nation? Yes, we saw that basically all these feminists who called themselves feminists, uh, who started, who had networks, feminist networks around the world and in the Ottoman Empire, put these infrastructures and the uh, institutions like schools turned into orphanages very easily. Like the Protestant school, which was founded to train Armenian girls uh, to become teachers to educate girls, became an orphanage. So basically, they uh, and we see this right now in Armenia. And that connects to uh, uh, Asya's question too. Like there is this unrecognized work, welfare, basic welfare service that feminists are providing to the survivors, right now refugees, displaced people from Artsakh, by thanks to the infrastructures that they build and networks that they build for feminist purposes. And in Armenia now, of course, also LGBTQI uh, networks. So basically it's very important to see that uh, the organized na nature of uh, political action and uh, the networks were in the Armenian experience at some point are all broken. And at some point you always have to be alerted one, there will be a day when you will have to put all these things in service of uh, the whole kind of nation, the whole Armenian people, the survivors. Basically, that is very definitive of Armenian feminism. And that's why I think it's very, we think that it's very similar to uh, the, the indigenous feminist critique because indigenous women always say this, you know, to the white feminism, like we want to be free, but what about, you know, the against assimilation, against, you know, also basic, like not even, uh, on the assimilation, basic like survival, like violence that uh, we have to. Um, okay, wonderful. So I will continue with this uh, train of thought with my next question coming from our friend Christopher Sheklian, and it's about the Christian connection. So it's a, it, it dovetails uh, nicely from what's been said earlier. And Christopher writes, Melissa, this is incredible. I am particularly interested in the characterization of Mari Beilerian as a kind of Christian anti-capitalist thinker. In 1891, Catholic papal encyclical uh, Rerum Novarum sets out an interesting route that criticizes the excesses of capital, like child labor, without endorsing socialism. But it is also, but it also states that women are by nature better fit for homework, uh, unquote. So it isn't exactly the best starting point for an emancipatory kind of feminism. Do you think that the ca Catholic social teaching might have influenced Mary Balerian's thinking? If not, what do you think the influences were that helped her articulate a Christian theology with an anti-capitalist and feminist bent? That's a very good question. As I said, like we have very scarce uh, like documentation of Mari's life and uh, thinking because the, the, the thing is when you're working on somebody who perished in the genocide, there is no archive. Like let's say we have uh, their letters, we have their kind of writings, the archives are uh, kept. So for Marie, like really like there's nothing. Uh, what I, we have the Tebi there and uh, the, uh, we went through the, the periodicals of the time to be able to understand what uh, she was reading and thinking. So I don't know what she was reading in terms of Christian uh, literature. Um, but actually coming back to the Khrimian question, Obvious that obviously she had she knew about Khrimian and she had connections with Khrimian. I don't know which other like Izmirlian. She had this fascination with Izmirlian. She regretted like initially she was 
uh, when she was this um, young Kunchak activist, she stood against him and like, and then later she regretted. It's very complicated. I also want to say that all these like women and people of that uh, century are so complicated thinkers. So I don't want to say like she was this and that, but she was like struggling thinking, <laughs> maybe even conflicting with herself because she was constantly producing and thinking about these things. Maybe Christianity is one, uh, like one philosophy thought that she, she wanted to like uh, play with uh, and like bring it together with feminism. We don't know, but I have a guess. This is kind of an informed guess. Uh, I don't think it's Catholicism, but I think it's American because she, American like missionary, I don't know if she ever met uh, any American missionaries but, or read, uh, but knowing that she know, knew and read Harriet Beecher Stowe and the fact that like um, the American abolition, the relationship with American abolition, abolish, abolitionism and uh, their relationship with like Christianity I mean, basically like uh, some of them were Christian sects. Uh, and this idea of you can use Christianity in, in Uncle Tom's cabin, basically like regardless of our criticism today to Uncle Tom character from the African-American philosophy of thought, we are critical. But back then it was an unheard of thing that a white woman to do the Christian faith was kind of writing something progressive using Christianity uh, to uh, oppose slavery. So these things probably is coming from like Alice Stone Blackwell or from Harriet Beecher Stowe. I'm, I'm imagining that she was more in touch with America, uh, like the US East Coast, uh, Armenians who had relation with uh, kind of uh, ABC FM and like the progressive abolitionist line of ABC FM. So that's my informed guess, but there is no documentation of that whatsoever. So, but she, I mean, she didn't refrain from like, she was not do trying to domesticate her anti-capitalism by like sugarcoating it with Christianity, not at all. On the contrary, she was very vocal about, um, you know, uh, like anti-establishment basically when it came to, it's very, I mean, I, that's why I want to call it, call her uh, a thinker. And when you see these women as like thinkers who are trying to engage with enlightenment philosophy, it's critique, Christian theology, like the, the, the spirit of the times and trying to like come up with, then you, you have a lot of room for, um, sophisticated and layered, layered reading, you know, it's, it's better. We have the luxury to say that, like, she, she said this in this text, and then that's why I like doing that, like, text back and forth. She said this in this text, and the other. And then the, always we have to remember that this is a life, an intellectual life that was cut very short with the genocide. We don't know what she would say after the genocide and how she would bring all these things together. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we'll just take a couple more questions. I'll pose one that's a little bit of a combination. So some of our viewers have asked about Mari Bailarian's relationship influenced by or of other uh, women intellectuals, uh, Mariam Vardanyan, Maro um, Nazarbekian, I think you referred to, but perhaps uh, Shushanig, uh, Gergrinian, Serpuhi Dusab, uh, Zabel um, Yesayan. Can you talk about, you know, her influence on, on others of uh, that period? Oh, uh, yes, you... definitely. Serpuhi Dusab was everybody's goddess. So uh, obviously, Mari also wrote about Serpuhi Dusab uh, because Serpuhi dies in 1901 and uh, yeah, Mari kind of gives space to another woman's uh, account on Serpi, on Serpi's like first uh, death anniversary. So we know that she was aware of Serpi. Interestingly, like unlike the others who like, for example, Zabel Asadur, 
visited Dusab, wrote about Dusab actively. Isabel Yesayan visited Dusab and wrote about her in her memoir and uh, in her autobiography and wrote extensively about uh, Dusab. Uh, and they wrote about each other. Um, yeah, these, especially the, the 12 women that we studied, the reason why we uh, focus on these 12 women is because we argue that they are, there's a, there's a chain and this chain is kind of an uninterrupted because all these women, I mean, this doesn't mean that there weren't other chains, but this is a major chain. These women either knew each other, worked together in the same organization, Askanavel and Tbretaser, and they were, uh, they wrote in each other's journal. And we have like letters in our book, we have uh, unpublished letters that these women corresponded with each other. But Mari, interestingly, uh, unfortunately, because we don't know Mari's like network, uh, I I mean I know that Mari was writing about the Adana uh, massacre, Adana pogrom, but she doesn't mention about Arshaguhi and Yesayan going there. So this is very interesting how Mari kind of um, is. I don't know if it is because of her politics. I don't know if it is because she was in Egypt, but in an interesting way, for example, uh, I'm sure that she knew about Zabel Yesen, for example, because there is an issue of Azat Pem in, in, in Cairo back then uh, that features both Mari's and Yesayan's uh, article on the same issue. So, but it's very interesting that most of the other women, they wrote about each other Mari wrote a lot about Armenian women, other Armenian women, like historical figures and her comrades. But I think her focus was more on non-elite women. And that's actually an interesting uh, thing to explore. And we are a little bit discussing it in, in, in our book, but uh, these are a bit more like speculations right now because there's no archive. But uh, I have a sense that, and also she worked at the Arhesta Ar Notes. She was a student in Esayan, Esayan. So like, obviously she's coming from that. Uh, and also obviously Teotik knows her, knew her. Uh, I mean, hundred percent, we can say that she is from that network, but uh, she had this obsession about focusing more on laboring classes, just like, yes, I am also focused a lot on laboring classes. So, uh, okay. yeah, you. I mean, that's all I know. In a nutshell, yeah, Great. thank you very much. In a nutshell. No. Sorry, I'm like, this is so like becoming- no, I know, it was a big question. <laughs> so I am, I'm sure that um, uh, Dr. Bilal is uh, fatigued by the uh, lengthy question and answer period. We're very grateful to her. I have one last question for her before we are able to move on and sum things up. The question comes from another friend of ours, Armen Marsubian, who writes the following. Belerian's idea of freedom and liberty is based on enlightenment liberal, on an enlightenment liberal ideology of freedom, yet she separates herself from this enlightenment cosmopolitanism. Do you see a tension between her Armenian feminism and cosmopolitanism? Or does her Armenian feminism always override her cosmopolitanism? Okay, uh, I mean, thank you, Armen, for this wonderful question. One, I think cosmopolitanism, I wouldn't use cosmopolitanism because it's, it sounds very anachronistic to think about the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in her sense, we can say two things. One, the condition of her existence as an Armenian uh, um, in the Ottoman Empire is coming from uh, being a subject, being a citizen, if you want to use the anachronistic term, of an empire where uh, different ethno-religious groups were organized in a hierarchical manner. So that, that's, the, that's the Ottoman Empire. So, and she is part of a political organization that asks the Ottoman government, the state that, that is her government, her, her state to implement reforms to, on her people. So basically she is the product of an empire. She is a subject of an empire. 
and she is the subject of she's an Ottoman Armenian intellectual. So in that sense, she's as Ottoman as it can get. So all of these women are Ottoman. So and their interaction with other Ottoman uh, subjects are also very Ottoman. Uh, in that sense, yes. At the same time, she is very much in touch. This is very unique to her. She's very much in touch with Russian and, as I said, Iran and like, diaspora Armenians. So she's also like very much like informed by uh, Armenian nationalist ideas developing in other parts of the world in different terms, especially like uh, her, mm, because her journal was not allowed technically in the Ottoman mainland until uh, the you know, restoration of the uh, constitution, her intellectual kind of um, correspondences with more like Tiflis, Tbilisi, Armenians. Um, about enlightenment and so basically, of course, all of these women were coming, I mean, feminism itself is like French Revolution, American Revolution, enlightenment, like liberal ideas, the individual rights, freedoms, but also the feminist critique of uh, that, like dichotomies of like body, mind and like reason and emotions. So she's well aware of these things. And she is both endorsing and criti critiquing enlightenment, um, liberal feminism, uh, liberalism from a feminist perspective. In terms of, if you're asking about, like, I wouldn't say cosmopolitan, but internationalism, because she was like, like uh, within the domain of socialism, she was well aware. And I, this was the subject of another lecture I gave a couple of months ago about her ideas about Armenian revolution and its relationship internationalism, international socialism, because uh, she, it's very interesting. And in that sense, she's very kind of, I want to say like decolonial or very early on, she was writing about the importance of internationalism in liberation movements like women, laboring classes, working class. Like she was, very, I mean, we don't have any documentation, but I'm pretty sure she was reading Marx and Engels. But she wrote openly that, and I find this fascinating, and thanks for asking this question. She said, for Western socialists, she doesn't use socialists, but Western revolutionaries, asking Armenian revolutionaries to be internationalists and giving up on their like national struggle, may be assimilationist, which is a very like interesting critique from even today. I mean, in the 21st century, we're discussing this, right? Are we going to be internationalist or like where is, and then obviously like this decolonial perspective is helping us indigenous like black uh, lives matter. Like we are more conscious not to like dissolve and assimilate the like global um, kind of uh, movements, uh, justice movements into some like white universalist, like these arguments are like, are uh, critique, like um, post-colonial critique to enlightenment and universalism has its like seeds there in Mari's argument that like she says, I believe in uh, internationalism. I believe in international struggle of like working class women and like um, colonized people. But I also not, like really dialectical materialism, my material conditions, my response, my struggle is shaped in dialectical relationship with my material conditions in the Ottoman Empire. So it's a, I, I mean, I don't want to go uh, in detail to this, but I think she's very sophisticated. That's why I don't want to bring her into dichotomies of like, was she nationalist versus cosmopolitan? She, she had all these things and she was bringing everything together to make sense and to find a genuine path. Sometimes with conservative overtones from our perspective, even in her day, she was criticized. Sometimes very like mind blowing the progressive. And when you look at it, you say, wow, like I read this in 1960s, um, Franz Fanon. I mean, basically at some point I, started rereading Fanon and finding certain sentences so similar to Fanon, like uh, in Mari's writings. 
But I can't say that basically, like it, these are two different contexts, historical contexts, so. Hmm. And one thing I want to say, like anything that I, of course, this is my interpretation. And I want to have a more like dynamic, uh, relationship with these texts in terms of, in, instead of burying them into, oh, yet another like manifestation of feminism and nationalism, yet another manifestation of life. Because if you do that, do this to like each person we study, each like uh, thinker we study, then we will basically bury them under like everything is coming from the West or everything has already been said. So this is post-colonial, this is enlightenment, this is, but I really kind of want to bring everything together and try to understand like what she was trying to do uh, and engage, engage with the text uh, a little bit more like experimental, not to overread things, but more experimental uh, way, because I think we have the luxury to do that. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is uh, the end of our Q&A session. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Melissa Bilal, for this wonderful lecture. Um, I, Sabu, did you want to make a quick announcement before I conclude, or would you like me to include your announcement in my... So, I'm not hearing you. Uh, so I can go ahead. I, I okay. I can make it very quick. Oh, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Melissa, once again. Uh, my announcement is that um, on the 22nd of April, in other words, in a few weeks time, uh, slightly over a month's time, uh, my chair, the Richard Ovanissian Chair of Modern Armenian History at UCLA is uh, hosting a, a very important lecture in an inaugural lecture series that uh, will be beginning with this year called the Raymond H. Keborkian Lecture Series on Genocide Remembrance Day. And our distinguished speaker this year is Harry Haritunian, uh, one of the most celebrated scholars of Japan and the son of genocide survivors who will be talking about his parents' his memoirs and reconstructing them through a void that has been left behind through a series of silences. I will end here, but I also add that the Promise Institute and the Armenian Studies Center at the Promise Institute is also a generous uh, co-sponsor of this event. The invitations will be going out from both the Promise Institute as well as my chair uh, in the next few days. So if you're tuned in, please sign on and register for this important uh, lecture. Thank you so much once again. And thank you. Thank you, Sabu. And thank you once again, uh, Melissa, for a very stimulating lecture and discussion. This was just such a wonderful summary of your impressive scholarly work on Mari Bailarian. And I know we all learned a great deal from this. Uh, let me close this webinar by announcing a couple of additional Zoom based um, events and YouTube based events that the Promise Armenian Institute will be um, hosting. The first on Monday, March uh, 29 at 10 a.m. Pacific time, we are going to be partnering with the Armenian Students Association at UCLA in presenting a panel after the second Karabakh War, Re-envisioning the Diaspora. This is a discussion with Drs. Vikan Chetarian and Razmik Panosyan and they will be exploring the future of such issues as strategies in the diaspora, uh, diaspora Armenian relations, the vitality of Armenian diaspora communities and so forth. On Friday, April 9 at 11 a.m. Pacific time, the Promise Armenian Institute will again be partnering with the Armenian Students Association in presenting a conversation with Dr. Jirai Libaridian. And this will involve interactions between uh, Dr. Libaridian and UCLA students and faculty, but will be broadcast on YouTube uh, to be publicly available. And then finally, on April 22, as Professor um, uh, Aslanian has mentioned, the Hovanissian chair will be sponsoring the uh, distinguished lecture by Professor Harry Haratunian. And there were, are many others uh, in the pipeline. Please consult our Promise Armenian Institute website, follow us on social media, and you'll be informed on all of these events. So once again, thank you for your attendance at this lecture. We look forward to having you participate in future events 
that are hosted by and sponsored by the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA. Have a great rest of the day.